launch a really quick poll question, which just has three simple little questions here. So you should see that and re respond during the next couple of minutes as we get started. So for those who just joined us, you should see a poll question on your screen and then we'll get started for real in another minute or two. Okay. Uh, thanks to those who responded to the poll. Uh, my name is Scott Smith at the US DOT Volpe Center. Uh, Hannah and I will be hosting today's webinar, which is organized by Zephyr Transport Foundation. So a big thank you to Elizabeth Soul, who's working behind the scenes to keep this going. Uh, just a quick reminder is uh, code of conduct is pretty simple, uh, just be civilized. Uh, and for discussion, uh, we'll have more discussion later on, but use the chat box to post questions or comments. And then um, for the last half hour, we'll really be an open discussion. So use raise hand if you'd like to speak. Uh, one note is uh, Zephyr is recording this session, so be be aware of what you're saying or what you're sharing on your screen. Uh, and with that, uh, quickly, you know, summarize the poll is okay. A few of you attended our May 20 May 2020 Zephyr workshop. About a third of you attended. Two thirds did not. Um, wide variety of organizations, uh, kind of academic consulting, government and MPO, uh, sort of even split. And most of you are pretty experienced with travel modeling. So hopefully uh, you'll see some insight as we start trying to think about the bridges between travel modeling and system dynamics. Uh, and with that, I would like to quickly introduce the speakers today and what I'll ask you to do is just when I call on you, uh, just switch 
quickly switch on your camera if you'd like. Uh, just do like the 20 second introduction and then we'll launch into the content. Uh, so just going from the order of presenters, uh, Alex Bettinardi, Oregon DOT. Yeah, uh, Alex Bettinardi. Uh, I work in the planning section of the Oregon Department of Transportation. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Martin, Lane Transit District. Hi there. Uh, my name is Andrew Martin. I'm at Lane Transit District. I'm a planner there. And uh, we primarily serve uh, the Eugene Springfield area in Lane County in Oregon, um, but also a lot of the smaller communities that are pretty close by. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Marty Milkovitz. Hi, I'm Marty Milkovitz. I work at the Boston uh, Region MPO. I'm the Associate Director of Regional Modeling Analysis. So I oversee the maintenance and updates to our travel demand model. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kate White. Hello everyone, my name is Kate White. I'm the Public Outreach Coordinator with Marty at the Boston Region MPO, working on both community engagement and communications for our agency. Okay, thank you, Kate. Uh, Tim Reardon, are you on? Hi, I'm Tim Reardon. I'm the Director of Data Services at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. We're the regional planning agency for Metropolitan Boston, so sort of a sister agency to uh, the Boston MPO. And our shop produces uh, demographic and land use forecasts for the region that feed into the travel demand model. We also support our agency's um, long range planning and a lot of the technical assistance activities we provide to our cities and towns, yeah. as well as our legislative advocacy work. Okay, thank you. Uh, then uh, Jeremy Raw. Thanks, Scott. I'm Jeremy Raw with the Federal Highway Administration Office of Planning, where I do modeling and data analysis support, uh, ponder planning for connected and automated vehicles, look at uh, new approaches to planning and supporting that with models, including strategic modeling and system dynamics that we'll talk about today. I'm the project manager for the Vision of Val Pooled Fund as well. So, uh, and I'll talk briefly about that as we kick all of this off in a few minutes. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jeremy. And now I'll start on our own team, uh, Jing Su Shaw. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jing Su Shaw. I'm a technology policy analyst uh, at the uh, US DOT VOPI Center. I'm a colleague of Scott, Hannah, Ian, and then Joe uh, on the VOPI team that we collaborate with the uh, Oregon and the Boston MPOs to conduct some of the uh, modeling exercises using SD approach. Today, I will present on the team's behalf um, talking about our collaboration with the MPO. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then I'll quickly, in terms of acknowledgements, I won't, won't ask you to introduce yourselves, but I want to thank two other members of the Volpe team, uh, Joe Stanford, who's on our SD team, will be jotting down some notes for our, our understanding of the, of, uh, the outcome and Ian Berg, who is running the slides for us and helping me with the technology. And then finally, from the Volpe team, let me introduce Hannah Rakoff, who will introduce herself and then launch into the content. Hi, thank you, Scott. Um, I'm Hannah Rakoff. I'm an engineer at the US Department of Transportation Volpe Center. I've uh, been working on this project with modeling automated vehicles along with Scott since about 2015. Um, and I realized this dynamics would be helpful for that modeling um, around 2017 or so and brought it in and that has flowered into um, this wider system dynamics work and on more than just automation and we're very happy to finally be doing it now with you know, so to speak, real practitioners, real people. We, we love real people in the federal government because we don't always get to get so close to it ourselves. So we're thrilled to be doing this with people from Oregon in Boston over the past year and to be able to share that with you today. Um, Scott, do we go into, do I go into the agenda slide now? Yeah, this is the time, yes, thank you. Okay. So with that said, up today, we start with Jeremy Raw at the Federal Highway Administration, who will be talking about um, the planning role for system dynamics. And then it's on to Oregon with Alex and Andrew at um, Oregon DOT and Lane Transit District, respectively, talking about the Oregon Modeling Steering Committee's 
emerging technology work group um, and their work exploring the use of system dynamics. Then we come back to the East Coast, looking at exploratory scenario planning, challenges and potential system dynamic solutions uh, with an example of remote work. And that's Tim, Kate, and Marty um, from the Boston organizations, as well as my colleague, Jing Se Shaw, in discussion, which I will moderate along with Scott. So without further ado, let me pass it on to Jeremy Rott, Federal Highway. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, and uh, to everybody in the audience, welcome to the future. Uh, as planners, we're faced with a growing need to support de decision makers in addressing emerging phenomena that we really don't understand fully yet. We've got automated vehicles, electric vehicles, micromobility, on-demand shopping delivery. And I'm going to stop on that list because if I kept going, I'd probably fill up the entire hour and a half. At the back end of the list is telework, the fallout from COVID, changed use of transit. Uh, a lot of these phenomena are overlapping. And one of the things that we're challenged with is we try to establish what might happen, what the risks are to our transportation investments and policies. Um, they have joint effects. And so we can take them on individually. We can look at them as a group. Uh, as joint effects, their results are often more mysterious than what they might be even as individual things. It's hard enough to imagine what self-driving cars might mean on the road. Uh, and when we start factoring that in with micromobility, shared mobility, and other factors, it gets way more complex. So we've been looking for methods at Federal Highway to explore alternatives that would help people make confident decisions even when they're uncertain about what to expect from the future. Uh, we've gone after this through scenario planning, through the travel model improvement program, and the exploratory modeling and analysis tool. But we still need to think as well about ranges of scenarios and the likelihood magnitude of these joint effects that we're going to talk about. And that's really where the system dynamics comes in. Um, and, and this is actually really important for us to do in advance because setting up a good set of scenarios as talking points for public involvement or for uh, policy analysis or even for deploying the models that we already have uh, can be very challenging. And we don't want to spend a lot of time on combinations of factors that in practice aren't going to amount to much. So we'd like to get an advanced sense of that. So what system dynamics gives us and what we'll hear about today are approaches to uh, formulating our ideas about how the world works so that we can uh, look at things that may have changed and start to examine the different possible outcomes without necessarily having seen a lot of it in practice or fully worked out all of the details. Uh, so, so we're not talking about replacing our traditional models. One of the very important pieces of this is it's not about producing a better model. I mean, you know, many of us are still, you know, and I, I've probably been victim to this myself, are tied to the idea that if we just come up with a really good model, we can answer every question that comes at us. But I think one of the things that's clear with new technologies and, and the new, um, you know, let's just say forces at work in the world is that we don't really know what to expect and we don't know what we should put into our models. And so a lot of what we're exploring are the beginning points, the things that we would translate later into those models. The other factor is that because of the way we build and calibrate models, a lot of this is relying on survey data, responses from people in the past. Uh, I'll pick up telework as an example for this. We have evidence from the National Household Transportation Survey and many local and regional surveys about how teleworkers behave. We have no idea whether that's going to apply in the post-COVID era. How many more people are going to telework? Will their behavior still represent what happened before? We build our models, though, on the basis of what we have, not what we wish we had. And a lot of that ends up building in the way the world used to be, not the way that it's becoming. And so the opening here for tools like Vision Eval or strategic models uh, in general, uh, scenario planning as an approach, and the system dynamics models is to give us a way to think more effectively about the things that we don't yet know. So having said all of that as an introduction, and, and hopefully I've, I've put in your minds the idea that this is novel and yet really important for us to make good use of the tools we already have. Having said all of that, I'm going to pass the floor on to Alex Bettinardi and um, 
kick off the actual substantive content of this, uh, which I'm really looking forward to being part of. Thanks for being here today, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. That was that was a great great setup, um, uh, uh, great transition there. So. Um, uh, Andrew and I would like to share kind of how Oregon has been starting to uh, apply this um, additional tool as, as Jeremy um, framed up. Um, and so uh, if you go next slide, Ian. So uh, just a quick overview of, of what we're gonna touch on, um, just a little bit of background on the Oregon Modeling Steering Committee, the OMSC, uh, the work we've been doing around uh, emerging technology and, and, and now adding in system dynamics. Uh, hearing from Andrew on how uh, this this you know has potential to benefit Lane Transit District as well as as some of the the more traditional uh, modeling um, agencies within within Oregon and then some of the uh, findings that we're uh, pulling out of the system dynamics work. Next slide. So as context, uh, your OMSC is a little unique. Um, just kind of reading the definition there, the OMSC is a voluntary collaborative of state, regional, and local agencies working to ensure Oregon has the right data tools, skills, and expertise needed to answer important questions about our transportation system, land uses, and the economy. And so um, the OMSC is, is a group of uh, um, transportation modelers uh, uh, in the state of Oregon that get together and try and you know pool resources and ideas. And so uh, I'm representing a, a number of people that that, that were on uh, that were a part of this discussion. Um, uh, Kelly Clark, Ray Jackson, Nick Meltzer, in addition to others uh, that have all been thinking through this. Uh, next slide. So um, the OMSC has been, you know, kind of thinking about uh, you know strategic assessments and and what the future means to transportation. You know, specifically in 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 recent years, specifically around emerging technology. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I wanted to mention on this slide that, uh, you know, early on Vision Eval came out of this, you know, uh, fell out of this desire to kind of want to explore strategies. And um, since then, we've been using our, um, our trip based and our activity based mod uh, travel demand models to explore, um, to, you know, to, to, to try and better understand uh, uncertainty and, and what the future might hold. And now we're in, in this current stage of uh, also uh, employing or deploying uh, system dynamics to further our knowledge. Uh, next slide. And so what that looks like, just a couple of clicks here. So you know, we had Vision Eval exploring space. Um, ne next click is, uh, you know, we also used our trip-based models to work through a series of questions around technologies. And uh, the next click, uh, most recently, we teamed up um, our AVM with uh, Team of EMAT. To, to these explorations. And so these are just some quick Im images to show, you know, that we've been kind of, um, you know, doing a lot of work to stretch and test test our models, um, uh, you know, and, and to fill as, the, as many, uh, to fill as much gaps in our knowledge as possible. Uh, next slide. And so like, like Jeremy hit on, um, and so this is just a re-emphasis, the goal here is not to replace um, our travel demand models or the other tools that we have. Uh, system dynamics is really another tool in the toolbox. The analogy uh, that I, you know, in my mind is, you know, for like maybe simpler questions, you can just jump right in and start excavating. But, it, you know, I, I think system dynamics, uh, the system dynamics approach is really uh, an upfront planning like survey level tool to understand the ground that you are about to, about to rip apart if you're gonna push a new road through. And so, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's an it's a it's a it's a helpful tool, I think, for surveying and understanding the space uh, up front. It's an upfront tool. Um, next slide, yeah. And so, <clears throat> so for us, where where does system dynamics fit? Um, when this opportunity was presented to us, uh, you know, as as the OMSC, we discussed how to use system dynamics and what we wanted to explore. Uh, we started to narrow in on understanding. Uh, or wanting to understand the motivators to transit ridership and what those could teach us, um, you know, specifically kind of thinking through, well, if we understand how people um, are making choices around uh, uh, the transit option, we might have lessons that we could extrapolate to uh, new modes and new technologies. And um, and then also there was immediate interest in, in thinking through how um, health and safety concerns were impacting transit ridership from a COVID perspective. 
And so as this conversation um, it, it, you know, grew, uh, we ended up bringing in um, additional practitioners uh, like, like Andrew from Lane Transit District in the Eugene area. And, um, and, and so during this process, Andrew has been one of the participants you know, to see um, the direct applicability and use. So um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew to just share a little bit of, of his uh, experience with this so far. Awesome, thanks, Alex. So um, I think, you know, uh, I got brought in a little bit into the process and almost immediately um, I was struck by, I think, how much uh, value that I think that we'll eventually get out of, out of doing the process this way. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that modeling is uh, at a transit agency really essential, um, particularly, you know, traditionally we've used that on capital projects and service changes to do things like estimate ridership, uh, maybe travel times. Um, we can look at price elasticities when we're thinking about changing our fares to see how that's going to affect ridership. Um, but the kind of reality is that a lot of the time when we're doing policy making, um, modeling doesn't really inform our choices as much as it, maybe it could or we'd like it to. Um, partially because I think some of the traditional models that uh, maybe I've worked with and have access to, um, like four step models, FTA stops model, T best, those are. Uh, maybe they're not modeling the right questions. Um, and at the end of the day, our board and the public um, kind of, I think, at least through my conversations with them, a lot of, a lot of uh, maybe less people who do less modeling view them as kind of a black box and, and they don't understand where the numbers are coming from. And as a result, they have a little less trust in the model um, and systems dynamics pretty quickly struck me as a way to, I think, um, simplify some of the choices that we're, we're trying to, help people understand the outcomes of. Uh, next slide, please. So a great example of that is something that has come up um, a number of times. I feel like I have conversations at least once a month with someone who's interested in um, kind of a free fare system or, or lower fares on our system. I saw an article this morning that that's apparently a topic um, in the political races in Boston. Um, so it's not just Oregon on this call who's, who's facing this. And, a lot of cities have uh, very different responses to conversations about free fares. Um, locally at LTD, we discussed this quite a bit um, and did public engagement around it as we got new state funding and looked at doing a system redesign. And one of the key things that we identified was that when we're looking at equitable outcomes, which is something that's very important to us, um, lower fares definitely lead to better outcomes, particularly for lower income people, um, they can save money. But one of the um, kind of other sides of that is that I don't know of any transit agency who, uh, at least in the United States, whose um, you know, service level adequately meets all of their community's needs. So um, to take away money from fares also means not adding more service. And both of those things are actually really important to equitable outcomes. Uh, so this systems dynamics work, um, I'm really looking forward to continuing to develop it because I think it's really applicable to policy conversations that we will continue to grapple with. And by working with um, kind of the modelers up front, um, myself and, and other people who are more uh, on the planning and, and practitioner side, it's been really useful to kind of help direct the model in ways where um, it's gonna be really speaking to that um, kind of policy trade-off that we are forced to deal with on the public and um, kind of dealing with our, our boards and decision makers. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, so like I said, really big benefits, I think, in getting the modelers and planners together at the beginning so that the, the model that we're working on really addresses the policy question um, that we're going to have to address. But I, I think Systems Dynamics offers um, a really great tool. Like Alex said, it's, it's a different tool, um, maybe looking at a different scale than some of the models we have before. Personally, I'm really excited to look at the cohorts. Um, that's something that we um, kind of in the scenario planning world, uh, we're, we're building in cohorts in the model. So we're, we're looking at that trade-off between adding service and lowering fares and how, how that works, but also how it works for different types of people. So for lower income folks, right, um, getting to work on time and, and adequate service levels, super important. Lower fares are also extremely important. Uh, for someone who's higher income, maybe it's more of just that service level side. So being able to break it out and talk about different cohorts of people um, and how they're experiencing these things and how that can lead to different outcomes 
is I think gonna be really positive um, as we continue to refine this model. So um, I'm gonna kick it back over to Alex and I think we're gonna talk through some of the, the findings we have so far. Yeah, perfect, thank you, Martin. So just kind of exposing behind the curtain a little bit. Um, so we, for this, preparing for this webinar, we, we knew we had to share some some kind of like hard findings. It can't just be high level. Well, this is this is helpful and 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 people should consider. So we wanted to provide some specific examples, but the, the cake isn't quite finished baking yet. So we're somewhat looking into the oven here. Um, uh, the Oregon working with Volpe is, is still you know, kind of finalizing uh, the process and what we're learning. But, th you know, there's definitely been a lot of aha moments that um, that uh, are, are worth sharing and, and kind of help illustrate the, the, the value that this, the potential here. So th this first one isn't isn't necessarily something that is, free, you, you can only do with S uh, system dynamics. You can do this um, in any modeling approach, but in order to kind of, uh, uh, you know, provide some rigor to the system dynamics work. Uh, uh, Volpe uh, put together this, this little toy model of understanding um, to, to to better have the relationships right in in the uh, system dynamics model. And you know, a lot of these things after you expose them, it's like, well, obviously. Um, but you know, I I I'll throw I'll put this up. You know, my own experience. Th this did not dawn on me until after it was walked through. Uh, in this process, and um, and so what 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 this exposed uh, what this helped ex expose was that uh, so so a toy model was constructed a very simple toy model was constructed where with two transit routes to just kind of see how uh, ridership reacted to um, improvements to service uh, specifically headway um, as the as the one we were playing with and so the 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 quick aha thing that come, falls out of this is there's diminishing returns as you improve headway. Uh, if, if, you, if you double the number of buses on a line and cut headway from 10 minutes to five minutes, um, there's benefit out of that. But if you then cut, you know, double again and cut from five minutes to two and a half and then two and a half to 1.25 and, you know, down the line, at, at some point at doubling and adding buses, uh, um, you know, no longer, improves the headway by a, a meaningful amount. And this is, you know, it, somewhat obvious as I'm saying it out loud, but it, it was really helpful to kind of walk through up front, you know, survey the land and be like, ah, okay, that's that's an important thing to remember. And I think, you know, the way we set this up, you know, we were looking at, at, at transit to both understand how people are reacting to transit, but also to think about um, how this applies to future uh, modes and so in this example, you know, I think you can take this principle and move it to mobility as a service or TNCs, and think about like okay, like these, like you know, these these modes and these companies, there is a point, you know, there is an optimal fleet size out there, and it's it's clearly to, to build them revenue, but um, uh, it, there is a point where it starts to diminish returns if you have um, uh, there's a diminishing returns po uh, point of adding additional vehicles to the fleet, and that's um, uh, a helpful lesson that this process helped expose. Uh, next helpful lesson, please. <laughs> um, so it, it dawned on me as I was getting ready to share these slides today that, um, you know, I think we were kind of anticipating that a lot of people were coming into this with um, some uh, understanding of system dynamics models. And so I apologize that this is the first slide with 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 an image that's this complex. But I, th I think probably most people that would, you know, th that have interest in are showing up probably have a general image in their mind for how these system dynamics models works and the and in this case the causal loop diagrams for how um, how how you build relationships and I definitely don't want to walk through the complexity that's going on here but what was really interesting for me in this in this experience is um, you know I, I guess I was approaching it that you need one system dynamics model to represent case you know the case that you're looking at and uh, what what Volpe helped walk us through here is that um, for different populations, for different cohorts, you can have different models. And again, this is kind of like aha, like duh stuff, but um, uh, on this image, which is hard to see, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's showing that, you know, clearly if, if you're um, a captive writer, you don't, you know, don't have access to other options to consider. And so your writership is somewhat, um, uh, has has a different connection. Whereas if if you have high income and you have plenty of car access, you have other options that are uh, going to 
um, change your the way you look at the system and um, and and system dynamics allows you to uh, to represent that you're not forced into one model you can have many models for different populations um, and and I want to shift off this slide but so if we can go to the next slide but um, another lesson that was in that slide and it's too detailed and we don't have time to really dig through it um, there but there's a number of kind of uh, um, lessons that fall out of working through their, those causal diagrams that I didn't mention earlier, but I want to make sure that uh, I give credit that that these are not um, uh, th that these lessons were really uh, exposed by the team, mainly Volpe, and helping us kind of see these things. Uh, so um, just want to make sure credit is given there. Uh, so you know, one of the things. Uh, so if I can just quickly talk about these things that are falling out of those causal loop diagrams. Um, the, the first one is interesting that as you think about uh, how ridership is impacting funding and and how to keep, um, you know, how to build a successful uh, transit program, um, there's this interesting complexity where you, you'd likely want to provide transit for low income riders, but if you don't have high income riders also riding it, they don't have any skin in the game and and they might not be likely to support, you know, uh, tax increases um, for, for public uh, uh, transportation options. And so, you know, there's this interesting thought process of do you need um, uh, to have high income riders also on the, the transit system so that they're supporting um, additional measures and they want to see improvements, you know, they have they have skin in the game. and. What are the optics of that if you're building a transit system for, um, uh, you know, or, or for how you're how you're focusing that, uh, what you're trying to achieve there? And so, um, something that this these causal loop diagrams exposed. Uh, another thing, the second bullet there, that um, if there's too much delay and when you increase funding, if if you're if the public isn't seeing the benefits of that fast enough, and you start to tick up ridership. Um, you might lose the funding uh, before it really takes off. And so it is, the point there is that you need to make sure that the improvement is seen quickly so that you can continue to build on uh, the success of, in, of improving the system. Um, uh, another lesson, uh, eliminating fares um, might increase transit ridership, but you might eat away at the short walk trips where someone might hop on the bus for two blocks because it's free. And so that was an interesting lesson that's teased out. Um, Let's see. Of uh, free service may, um, uh, um, uh, if, if you do offer free service, um, it it will likely create more ridership. Um, and how does that impact the quality? And then, uh, lastly, like I kind of touched on um, with the first bullet, that the the source of funding funding can impact, like like who's who's writing and how it's getting paid for can impact. How the system is viewed, and and and, and learning that lesson helped me um, helped helped me see additional value from this process outside of the transit example. Because you know, currently Oregon's heavily um, involved in in understanding uh, or standing up a, a tolling process in addition to a VMT tax, and and in working with System Dynamics here, it, it or with this example, it it helped me see that. Uh, you know, similarly, as you set up a, a, a user charging system, um, you know, there's a lot that you have to think through on that side. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, what I want to get across on this slide is that there's a ton of opportunities, you know, I think, I think with doing system dynamics, mainly around, you know, the themes there are, are on better communication and team building and, and, and setting out a path for the work that's going to the more detailed work that's going to occur. Um, I would just caution a little bit because because Oregon took on has has had a number of years of attempting system dynamics work, um, and I'd say the first couple attempts that we did were a little bit more um, having novices pick up the idea and give it a shot, and it was somewhat of a dead end. And so you know I think the work with Wolfie here has been really good, and I think the lesson is that you kind of need someone. Who's had a little bit of training, you know, a little bit more than nothing, <laughs> some training in system dynamics modeling and work to help facilitate the discussion and help get the most use uh, out of that. And, and and the other lesson I would or I would hit on here is that um, 
it's been really great to bring um, multiple people, multiple different disciplines to the table and create a shared pool of knowledge and then have everyone kind of learn or leave that, that table with their own kind of action item and their own lesson that they can take back or multiple lessons and take back. A uh, last slide for me, if we could go one more. Um, so I, I, I kind of already uh, hit on these a little bit, but so the, you know, some of the, some of the bullet points we've already seen for how this has improved, um, you know, the work's still ongoing, but, um, you know, we're bringing modelers and planners together uh, and creating a kind of a common language for people to talk from. Uh, we're having everyone's mental models kind of converge from these different disciplines. Uh, the benefits of exploring, you know, more um, deeply exploring the scenario space. And, uh, you know, I think as a modeler, a lot of this has been revealing gaps around um, and blind spots of our current models and tools and thinking about how can we better fill those um, uh, and, 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 different, and different ways to approach that. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Boston's experience with Tim Reardon. Great, thanks so much. Um, and uh, I'm Tim Reardon with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. We're the regional planning agency for, for Metro Boston. And I'll just be introducing my colleagues from the Boston MPO and Jingso, who's gonna, who are gonna talk a little bit more in detail about um, so the work we did um, collaboratively, but I, I wanna provide a little bit of background to our motivation as, as the regional planning agency. Um, and the work that we do um, involves, you know, everything ranging from long range planning to uh, municipal technical assistance, rezoning activities, as well as policy advocacy, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and in addition to the sort of forecasting and impact analysis that, um, that our department does, um, we've also adopted scenario planning as really a, a central way and a, a central sort of lens through which we view our work and we use it to assess trade-offs, um, to set goals, to examine uncertainties in the forecast that we have. And, um, and we do that in a, in a lot of different ways. Our 2008 plan, Metro Future, which is the regional plan out to the year 2030 for, for the region, um, used a normative scenario planning approach. It was sort of one of those crop of regional plans in the 2000s that were all, you know, had, had a, a good, bad and ugly scenario to them. And we, you know, had people think about trade-offs and, and so forth. Um, and uh, that worked very well at the time. I think when we started doing our regional plan Metro Common that we're, that we're um, under, is underway right now, we decided we wanted to use a more exploratory approach to examine uncertainties about the future uh, in order to uh, identify with the ultimate goal of identifying policies that were robust across the range of scenarios, as well as contingent policies that we ought to put in place if things start to trend in a um, in a particular direction. And part of that effort was was examining drive was was identifying key driving forces in the region that will influence that are you know out of control of any really any public policy maker at least that you know in our sphere. Um, but we'll have a big influence on our region. Um, so those include things like demographic trends as, and, and um, sort of migration patterns and uh, choices about location, uh, federal policy, and then of course, transportation. Um, and, and, and in particular, the sort of the pace of innovation and adoption. And when we started the conversation about transportation as a driving force, a lot of it was really focused on issues of technology and technology that would reduce the, the, the cost, the time and money cost of getting from point A to point B. All those things that Jeremy mentioned, the micro mobility and the autonomous vehicles and ride hailing. And you know, it was, it was 2019. And so everyone wanted to talk about scooters and Uber. Um, and, and during the course of the conversation, we also said, well, what about, what about technologies and behaviors that may actually reduce travel demand? Um, through video conferencing or virtual reality or, or increased deliveries or telemedicine. And everyone sort of shook their heads and said, yeah, yeah, that, that, I suppose that could happen. Um, and so we, we included that as part of the driving, the driving forces analysis. Um, less than six months later, we enter a global pandemic in which um, no one's leaving their home for you know, months on end. Um, and we see this incredible explosion, not only in the, the range of technology and services, but also in the sociocultural adoption of those technologies and services that allow people to do all sorts of things without having to, to leave their home, um, such as this, this webinar and any other number of things. So, um, you know, we, we actually sort of 
entered this sort of experienced the driving force that we had talked about six months prior in a really dramatic way very soon after. And it wasn't long after that before our regional planning agency, the, the Mass Bay Transportation Authority, started discussing long-term changes in service levels or really big changes in service levels um, that, you know, without a commitment to returning things to the way they were before, because they'd seen like any other region, they'd seen big drops in, um, in travel demand, especially in our case, especially on, on the rapid transit and really on the commuter rail. Um, and, um, you know, we got pulled into that conversation and there were a lot of questions about the future of remote work and return to transit ridership and, you know, how many trips are people making, you know, during the day, you know, when they're working at home and all sorts of things for which there is just simply no definitive answer. We just actually don't know how those things are going to plan out. And we cannot know how those things are going to plan out. Our tools, the modeling tools that, that, um, that Marty will talk about, you know, they're not really set up to, to examine and test out those things. And most importantly, the decisions that are made today will actually influence the course of the future. And that was what we knew about what was going on with, with the T. That was sort of at the heart of our concern with the MBTA's forging ahead process, that if service levels are reduced without any commitment to, 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 um, uh, to return them to prior levels, then what we're likely to see is a sort of crisis of confidence in the transit system, right, as we're gaining some traction on transit-oriented development. Um, and, you know, a reduction in long-term demand, increase in auto ownership, like all these things we could sort of see, well, what happens if no one has any faith that the transit system is going to be there five years hence? Are they going to build that transit-oriented development? Are they going to live the car-free lifestyle? Any other number of things. So we knew this was going on and we wanted to define, we wanted to define those relationships so we could tell that story. And we also wanted to define them so we could start working with our colleagues at CTPS to figure out how do we actually start to simulate some of these things and put numbers on them. And, um, and start to express some of the concerns and, and almost intuitive relationships in a quantitative way. Um, and it was right about that time that we were contacted by the Volpe Center to participate in the systems dynamic process, which, which, has a, you know, which we saw as having this potential for identifying these specific interactions and feedback loops that we could use to start talking about what are the decisions that are being made right now what are qualitatively, what are the impacts that those could have uh, downstream and what are the feedback loops that they could kick off or accelerate and, um, and how do we start to model those? And um, you know, so we've been working on that over the last few months um, and in particular with our, um, with our colleagues at, um, at CTPS who are also um, engaged in examining these, these big questions um, and uh, big ideas as well as scenarios for their upcoming uh, long range transportation plan. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Kate White, who's gonna tell you a little bit about the work that she does engaging um, uh, Boston's, uh, Metro Boston's diverse stakeholders in the, in the kind of work that, that uh, the MPO does. Thank you so much, Tim, for the whole introduction and um, to talk more about the engagement process because I work primarily in public outreach. I'll talk about how we're really centering public engagement at the beginning of our exploratory scenario planning process. Um, so as the MPO, and a sister agency to the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, we also embark on a long range transportation plan every four years. And we're really looking at what we were hearing, not just you know, from our work, but also what we were hearing from MEPC, our transit authority, the MBTA, and other work done across the state. Um, and then we started thinking about how do we move into a space that incorporates more uncertainty um, so similar, like building off of what Tim said, we sought to um, use exploratory scenario planning to incorporate more uncertainty in our long range transportation process, which we do, which we are starting now and will be endorsed in 2023. Previously, we had done a lot around like normative scenario planning and this we really wanted to kind of capture both the uncertainty as I discussed, but like the relationships of the different transportation factors in our region. And to start this off, we did a series of virtual focus groups. These were primarily virtual because of the pandemic, um, but we also really wanted to reach out to a diverse range of stakeholders. You know, sometimes in transportation planning, we've kind of looked to our traditional stakeholders, maybe our municipal planners, our transportation advocates. We really want to incorporate a, a, a wide array of stakeholders. So people who work in public health, human services, housing, youth, education, um, and talk about mobility issues within our region. Um, and then what they will, what are the driving forces that will shape our regional transportation system over the next 30 years? 
and what we think are the most uncertain certain about these driving forces. I think too, as we think about incorporating uncertainty, we have our own assumptions. We really wanted to look at to our stakeholders and say, what do you think is important? What are the things we really don't know before we make those assumptions on how to analyze it later? We also began conversations around what strategies we could use to meet the needs of these divergent futures and work towards a more equitable and regional, re resilient regional transportation system. So in these spaces, we were also able to communicate how our analysis tools help us to understand impacts on the transportation system changes. And I think that's really key too, like we're talking today about how system dynamics helps us do our work, but also how to communicate how, how modeling works and how, how we're able to analyze impacts is really important to stakeholders because it builds up trust, but also understanding. Um, we tested different messaging and found that actually using a system approach to get input from a range of stakeholders was really successful. Um, and, but depicting the whole process of system dynamics model wasn't necessary, necessary to get the needed input. We could kind of craft and kind of build it up in the conversation, but we didn't necessarily have to display, hey, these are all the ways that um, certain factors will impact each other. Um, but we were able to convey the relationship of factors in our regional transfer transportation system. And now we'll work on processing that public input. We really got a ton of really great qualitative data and we'll move all of that into our scenario development as well as look to you know, our partner agencies um, and other work that's been collected in our region. And similar to what Andrew discussed, this process is of bringing together people who work on modeling and people who also work primarily in community engagement like myself has really streamlined a lot of our planning processes and better strengthened our own communication both internally and externally around the tools we have um, to do our planning work in the region. Um, so I can talk more about it later, but I'll hand it off to Marty Milkovitz to talk more about our regional model. Thank you, Kate. And so of course, Kate talked a lot about how um, the systems thinking approach uh, helped in the communication of the tools we have, but as a modeler, I mean, we wanna think beyond just the tools we have and, and how we might be able to extend those uh, in order to, uh, to help gain insight for these new challenges. So my role in this discussion is to really speak from that modeler perspective about um, when given a new set of critical needs from uh, collecting from stakeholders, the work that, that Kate's been doing, um, how do we incorporate that and, and try to uh, leverage the tools we have or extend the tools we have to provide good insights. Of course, the topic of the day is uh, remote work activity and you know how that not only just the initial uh, primary impact of changing uh, travel to work behavior, but also other aspects that uh, a model structure can help us understand. But you know, as, as common when you have a new challenge, it doesn't necessarily fit well within the existing model paradigm. Um, our, we have a trip-based model platform. It doesn't explicitly estimate the trade-off between commuting and discretionary travel from home. Uh, if we go back to our household survey data, we don't have very strong responses from households with remote workers. Um, switching to an ABM, which may capture more of that, isn't feasible in a time frame that, that Kate laid out there for, for our next LRTP. Um, and, and, and so in order to provide uh, useful input to those scenarios. Uh, and then the other aspect of this is that given the uncertainty we have around uh, considering these, these driving forces and uh, the number we want to test, um, we don't necessarily want to build out a very elaborate core model, you know, making a better model, as Jeremy mentioned at the beginning. Um, instead, we want to look for ways that we can leverage that structure uh, and use a meta modeling approach uh, to explore across a potential range of inputs. So we have connected our uh, regional model with TMIP EMAP and are planning to, to leverage that, but then we're certainly incentivized to keep that full, that core model runtime uh, down. So, um, and we, we need to, to specify those inputs and assumptions. Um, and, and then the challenge is translating that back into when we have the scenario, um, you know, how do, how do we connect these outputs to a, a compelling or at least reasonable story um, on the input side and how that's varied. And then being able to connect that even further back to the initial stakeholder concern and show how this insight uh, can give them some information around that. And we can go to the next slide. So we're going to talk through, actually, Jing Su is going to talk through uh, a work from home example with uh, an ST um, diagram. Um, so, but this is the point with this kind of challenge, uh, Tim sort of set up the initial exploration, uh, looking at uh, the transit service and that response. And now most recently, we've been kind of getting into the uh, grappling with the idea of how do we use an SD framework 
our causal loop diagram to, to give us that extension uh, and context around our, uh, our travel demand model for remote work. So in constructing this diagram, uh, we're hoping to, to support understanding several different factors. So I'm gonna go clockwise around this Venn diagram starting at the top. So there at the top is the, what are those factors uh, that influence the levels of remote work are, you know, where we are in a scenario. So picking a point across that range, what, a, what do these points mean? Um, and what's nice is as we consider this in this framework, we don't have to think about what can the travel demand model represent? How does it, you know, forcing us to, to think in certain ways about travel behavior. So then the, the next aspect of this is, um, you know, how, how can we see these playing out? So first this, this certain scenario level, um, what would be the, uh, the, the then connections to the transportation system and how land use responses. Uh, so this will help us see where else in our model paradigm, you know, the assumptions that are challenged and might need to be changed or relaxed. Um, so then finally, we can talk about, okay, what are the key mitigation points um, based on the insight the model has given us uh, is where we can encourage more positive outcomes and ameliorate the, the negative ones. So what's really nice is just, you know, we can, we've always been able to go through this process of thinking about the factors and then saying, well, this is what we can represent. Uh, but here with the feedback connections, um, we can actually start to see it as that system. So I hope this has been a, a reasonable setup for Jinxa to be able to describe more of the, the detailed materials and then walk us through uh, that process. Thank you very much, Marty. Uh, next slide, please. So modeling the impacts of telework on travel demand is challenging. As Tim and Marty mentioned, there are many changing inputs and then these inputs could interact with each other and with other factors over time. And let's take a look at some of the key trends associated with telework. So first, while telework has been widely adopted at the beginning uh, of the COVID outbreak, the nationwide percent of workers who telework because of the pandemic has been decreasing according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. In addition, studies show that um, workers who have been telework in the past few months face challenges such as lack of interaction with colleagues, Zoom fatigue, et cetera. And this indicate that returning to office could be attractive to telework workers. However, survey results regarding uh, workers' mode choice once they decide to go back to office, like this one in Metro Boston, shows that a significant proportion of workers plan to drive along. Uh, next slide, please. And then the, the next couple of slides demonstrate some of the key steps that the whole team has been following to develop a remote work model. So first, let's take a look at the two major feedback loops that influence the dynamics between work from home and the transportation. On the top of this diagram, there is a balancing loop that indicates as less people choose to telework, there could be more peak hour trips on the road and that lead to a higher congestion level and then further discourage travelers from going to work and then that increase the amount of telework. Uh, however, at the same time, on the bottom of this diagram, there is an interesting reinforcing loop. As the amount of tally work decreases, um, there will be more people um, going to uh, office, and that leads to more interactions among um, co-workers, and then people will see the improved um, perceived benefits of being on site, and that drive the per, um, perceived benefits of being in office higher and lead to less uh, tally work time. So the outcome of this loop could um, lead to much higher levels of in-person time at the end. So you can see these two loops um, work at the same time and could drive the amount of telework into different directions. And these two loops may look pretty obvious to us at this moment, but they didn't stand out when we first start building this model. And let's take a look at where we started. Uh, next slide, please. And so we start with brainstorming key factors that could drive workers' decision on telework frequency and then how telework decision could further influence the generation of different types of trips. And then we can focus on defining peak hour versus non-peak hour trips and then its, in, its impact on congestion because congestion could be a key factor that worker consider when reevaluating their telework frequency. So we put all these factors and relationship into this causal loop diagram. And as some of you who may not be familiar with the causal loop diagram, 
it is a tool to visualize how different variables in the system are interact, uh, interrelated. So here, there is no need to focus on the variables, the arrows, the, the signs. Um, please feel free to take a look at them later. And then what we want to show you here is how we capture the major loops from this detailed diagram. And so next slide, uh, next click, please. So starting from the center of the diagram is this big function called allocation of telegraph frequency. And that can determine the trips that will generate it and then also uh, peak hour trips. So the peak hour trips will lead to the impact of peak hour, uh, peak hour congestion. And the peak hour congestion will further feedback, uh, feedback into the employees' decisions of whether they want to allocate more telework time or less. And then this closed the, um, the next, next clip. And this closed the balancing loop. And then starting from the same uh, center point, uh, allocation of the telework frequency, that also influencing the onsite time that workers will take. And the onsite time will influence the perceived benefits of being onsite, and that further influence employers and employees' views of being uh, onsite. And so this will feed back to the um, middle function that determine the new telework frequencies, and that form the uh, reinforcing loop. So you can see these two uh, loops are very essential for modeling this behavior. And it's not very obvious at the beginning. Um, and then we found this system dynamic approach is really helpful for us to capture these big dynamics. And without like, losing the bigger picture, it's very important for modelers to, to think about. And also, I think this also reflects what Alex said. It seems kind of obvious when you got this uh, insight but it's not like a very clear at the beginning. So we need to go through this exercise. And then the finding um, and the outcome is pretty exciting. Uh, next slide, please. And as we could see, the detailed causal loop diagram bring value so we can collect ideas of key factors that drive telework decision-making and its subsequent impacts on trip generation and present these factors and then their relationship in a logical way. But after working on it for a while, we found that it could be useful if we could have a higher level framework so we can see all the key steps and components that are required to present these two feedback loops. So we, did, uh, so we developed such a framework as you can see on this slide. To briefly explain this uh, framework, on the left-hand side um, that represents four key aspects of variables and that drive the telework uh, frequency decision-making. And then so then we can um, decide what is the telework frequency will look like among workers um, by time of the day and the number of days. And then this decision of telework frequency is a key input to determine output of uh, onsite time and that further influence the benefits of being on site for workers. And this, this effect will look back to the employers and employees decision of the new telework level. So that closed the reinforcing loop. Uh, meanwhile, um, the outcome, um, the, the telework frequency could influence um, transportation in the system. And the outcome of tra uh, traveling is presented on the right. The key outcome from, travel, uh, from traveling including trip distribution over the time and also congestion on the road. So the congestion could be the main, uh, main driving factor for employees to, decision, to decide what is the new telework frequency levels should be. So that closed the, re, uh, the balancing loop. And then with this framework, we're able to identify which steps or components are missing when we are developing the detailed causal loop diagram. Uh, next slide, please. And as it's hard to demonstrate some of the interesting relationship that we identified between telework and the trip using the detailed causal loop diagram and then the framework we presented on the previous slides. Here is another view of the framework. As you can see, the modeling stage that we follow are pretty similar to the traditional travel demand model. Um, so this table shows the key uh, model stage including trip generation, time of the day distribution, mode choice, and then shows us a key decision that will be uh, generated and then what factors that will drive those decisions. But we can also add some of the new factors and relationship into the model. 
So from this table, you can see employees' concerns about being the only one who is on the, uh, who is not in the office could influence their decisions of whether they want to commute to work. So this is like a, one example. The team is still working on developing the whole model and the, what we're presenting today are some key uh, lessons learned. We hope the SD-based modeling exercise can help us identify in both modeling and data needs and provide some concrete insights for better modeling new changes to a transportation system in the future. And next, I'll pass this to Scott and Hannah for summarizing today's presentation and lead the discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jingsu. Uh, Scott Smith again. Uh, first, I do wanna capture one question in the chat. Uh, were you able to capture the impact of additional trips made from home during the day for those who are staying at home also the potential shift in non-home based. Uh, I'll start that our framework does include uh, the, you know, the, the shift to more daytime trips that people are working from home. And I don't know if Jingsu or you or anyone else wants to elaborate on that. Scott, if you don't mind that. I mean, I think this really captures, um, sorry, can you hear me okay? Go ahead. Yep. Okay, um, I, I think this is a great question and, and why we see the value uh, from from my perspective uh, in wanting to to explore scenarios around uh, you know, different levels of work from home behavior, um, it, but having this framework and, 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 and what, what uh, Jim has done and thinking through, okay, what's, what's the next effect of I'm staying home all day. I'm going to go and and run my errands in the middle of the day. Um, this freight where that's not explicitly represented in our trip-based model, this framework can help us see the correlation between those factors. So if we were to do something like adjust the number of workers that are going into our our home-based work generation process, it would we would need to to you know, we or this would help us see where there's a um, you know a potential relationship in the other uh, the trip purposes and and their generation rates. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so to go on to the general discussion, obviously you know additional clarifying questions are always welcome. So Ian, could you hop to the next slide, please? Yeah. So to launch the general discussion, uh, just so imagine a big change to the transport system. And I should say that uh, should acknowledge that our work is supported by the automation program of the USDOT ICS Joint Program Office with the initial motivation to thinking about, well, what might a disruptive new mode like automated vehicles mean to the transportation system? So big supply side change, this is our initial motivation for getting into it and it continues to be our motivation. But then uh, since then, we obviously have been living through a big demand side disruption for the past year. So. But I want you to know, so consider a big change, automated vehicles, micromobility, pandemic. Uh, and on the next slide, Hannah will review uh, some questions that I'd like to open up for our discussion. Hi, everybody. Yes. So there are kind of two ways to um, sort of look at this. One is about what you can get from the type of modeling exercises based around system dynamics that um, the folks from Oregon and Boston have been sharing with you today. So for instance, how could you use the outputs of that exercise or, or that kind of exercise to inform scenario modeling? And the examples we've listed there um, are all ones that we have and that they have either tried doing or talked about doing. So um, developing shared mental model with stakeholders. Um, Alex talked about that. Kate may also have touched on that a bit in Boston. Um, prioritizing planning tasks and steps. 
you know, thinking about sort of what sorts of pieces of the model are very critical to get into in great detail and which aren't we've been constantly working in on and refining that as we've gone through. Determining what indicators to track, well, obviously that ties in with um, both what your sort of task on planning is and also with the next question, which is, well then, okay, if, if that's the task I wanna do and that's the indicator I have to track, what, uh, what's, what are my data needs and do I need a different kind of survey than I've currently got? So I'd like to get some discussion going around that. And then separately looking even more zoomed out and large, um, in that sort of environment of, well, we didn't call it disruptive events. An earlier version of the slide called this disruptive events, but that makes it sound like we can't or shouldn't be prepared. And I think um, we can all appreciate what Tim was saying and talking about planning, which is, you know, scenarios are just scenarios, right? They're not good scenarios or bad scenarios, but large changes can occur. Then looking more broadly, what are the opportunities for going beyond the types of modeling that um, travel planners, MPO staff, et cetera, are currently often using. So how can system dynamics help you identify the gaps in those models? Where might system dynamics techniques help? And even more broadly, can SD help you think differently about modeling in a broad way? So for instance, um, four-step models are assuming an equilibrium a system dynamics model is not assuming an equilibrium. One may emerge, but if one doesn't emerge, so be it. And um, that might be how reality is, at least for certain extended periods of time. And then finally, anything else that um, strikes people's fancy kind of around these topics that you'd wanna bring up. So let's see, at this point, we are going to allow um, hand raising if you would like to speak and we can also, I see things flying in from the chat. We can also have a look at the chat and see what's there. And Scott and I will moderate the discussion. We have about 20 minutes and then we'll need to pass it over to Elizabeth Saul Zephyr to say a few words and uh, wrap us up. Scott, did you see anything in the chat that we should highlight? Hi. Yeah, I think there's an important comment is, you know, uh, Tim, thank you, Tim comment is that you know, our purpose here is defining relationships. And then, you know, if we can code them up, th then you think about, well, where do you get the data for these? And you may not have that, but that lends an opportunity to playing around with different assumed scenarios to really get its sensitivities to particular parameters you may want to explore, like you know, how many midday shopping trips might there be? Uh, and, and then definitely, and for May Ingram, thank you. Uh, yes, it's again, you know, this is definitely part of the strategic modeling toolbox where you can try out lots of scenarios and play in the space of sensitivity analysis. Uh, so if you'd like to elaborate or if anyone else would like to like to say anything, okay, we're going via chat. <laughs> we don't have to go via chat. We've so far been going via yeah. chat. It'd be great to get some other yeah. voices in here also. Would May or Pam um, to say a little more about your your points? Speaking? No, this is Pam. I just throw out, throw out, I'm just watching, you know, as we talk about how things have shifted. And yet, as I've looked around in Raleigh in the past month, even without the vaccine, I've seen so many people returning, even though they're teleworking outside of that, they've returned to the new, the, the norm. And I'm yeah. wondering, are these changes that we're planning or thinking about are they only going to be temporary or are there some things that will be permanent shifts in how we do things? It's interesting questions. I mean, I, I guess it was sparked by that, you know, we think, oh, telework and there won't be as many people on the roads, but then, you know, Boston was sharing that more people are going to drive alone now. They're not going to ride the transit. They'll ride alone. Yeah. So, that's it for me. 
Go ahead. Would any of our, thank you, Pam. Would any of the panelists like to comment on some of the challenges of modeling when you don't know whether something is temporary or the beginning of a new equilibrium? I feel like this is such a perfect setup for your equilibrium versus not needing to <laughs> reach an equilibrium, right? <laughs> Right, exactly. And it might be, I mean, when you run a model, you've seen them run, Marty, you know, it takes like a second or a second and a half, and then you've got the curve and you can see, okay, well, it started with something that was a big spike and then it became flat. But as you're running it, imagine if that were 20 years, like, is that equilibrium? Is that equilibrium? Is that going to be, you know what I mean? So, exactly. Well, I think the Pam's, I mean, Pam's question is a good one. And, you know, I think we're all, everyone who's in this business around the country is thinking about questions like this. I, I guess, you know, the point I was trying to make in my comment earlier is that I think the value of an in system dynamic is to, is you can look at that, you know, those causal loop diagrams and, and, and see places where particular choices or behaviors or particular unknowns will have um, really widespread impacts. And so you can start to look at those places. I mean, the answer to Pam's question is, is currently unknowable, right? We don't know. And all we could do is speculate, which doesn't do anybody any good. Um, ex until and unless we start to say, how do we understand what are, the, what, it, what are the impacts of a range of assumptions here, a range of outcomes? And I think Hannah, to your the fourth sub bullet on your first bullet, data needs and surveys, we can't track everything about the recovery and the travel, the changes in travel demand and travel behavior as we recover from the pandemic. So we actually have to choose what are we gonna follow? And are we gonna follow like, you know, how many people are ordering dinner online or are we gonna, you know, you're gonna like track other things. And so I do think that, that the causal loop diagram is an important tool to help us and systems dynamic is a tool to help us think about where do we prioritize our data collection and the improvements of our models at high leverage point areas. Um, and let's work from there and then start to assess, you know, what's, what are the range of outcomes? Thank you, Marty. I think you yeah. See your hand, Marty. Yeah, I, 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 I want to actually go back to something that Pam said. I don't want to bury Tim's point about the data, though, because I think that's a, so. Maybe we'll just view my comment as like a little tangent, a little reverse back. But one of the things, and so we had an experience where we were, were taking one of our earlier um, uh, causal loop diagrams and talking to other stakeholders, and this was around the the transit ridership and how cuts to service might affect in the short, medium, and long term. And one of the things that came up was, what if people don't come back to transit, even if you restore service, even in the short term? And I want to say this is the, the potential of system dynamics. I, I felt it there. It wasn't fully realized, but the potential was there's space, right? So if someone says, I don't think it's going to play out that way, there's space to say why, right? And to say, why wouldn't it? And 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 I what I really like about it is it 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 encourages us to follow more of a systematic kind of thought process where okay, tell me what the factor is. Let you know, let let's see how that fits in rather than just saying, well, these are the assumptions of my model. This is all I can do. You know, you have to to put it into your head and, and figure out how to adjust based on your other doubts. Um, so it, the potential wasn't realized in that meeting, but I, but I was encouraged that like, okay, there's there's you know room at the table for these other kind of thoughts. But that back to the identifying the data needs. I was actually going to follow up with Marty's question. Could be for you or for any of the other panelists in Boston or at Oregon. Um, is that? a kind of conversation that would have been more difficult without system dynamics? And if so, can you give us a sense of how? I mean, yes, because the other model structures are, I'll say are not necessarily as intuitive, um, have a higher bar to, to understanding. So 
to engage someone to the degree that they can actually look at it and say, this is, this is the point where, you know, I think the assumption should be different. Um, so it's, so I, I find it to be easier to have that conversation. Now, the challenge is we don't have an SD model that's based on data that's calibrated that we can run and produce something, right? So it's so that's where we're seeing it. I'm seeing it as this right. extension helping us put context around the scenarios. And coming back to there's a there's sort of this alluring promise, but it's asking for kinds of data that aren't quite there yet. Sort of Tim's point, it helps us see where the key data would be valuable. Yeah. I guess I have a slight a tweak on your question, Hannah, and it's specifically for our colleagues in Oregon who, you know, is, is where did that conversation go about the, this sort of potential set of cascading influence uh, impacts of free transit ridership or other changes in the system? Like how did, how did people internalize that? And was there, was there a receptivity to that continuing change um, or, you know, in that, that sense that, that there's this ongoing cascade of impacts. Um, yeah, maybe Andrew has a more satisfactory answer. I mean, uh, unfortunately, we're still kind of in the process of, of finalizing it. So I, I don't know if we have um, uh, a, a great example to share. Um, yeah, I, un unfortunately, I. Um, I'll say, well, it's not unfortunate, actually. The, it, I think that's an ongoing policy conversation. It's something we've been um, kind of dealing with for years, and I'm not sure that there's a right answer. You know, it's, it's I think, something where there are a lot of values involved. Um, but I think the, the real um, promise I'm seeing in the modeling that we're doing is that we can have a better informed conversation. And um, we're, we're kind of trying to add those cohorts um, in right now so we can really start to understand how it affected different groups. Um, but like I said, applying that equity lens and really um, trying to understand how it affects the different groups, I think will help move that conversation along. And I'm not sure, um, right, I'm not a policymaker. I'm not sure we're going to get to free fares. Um, right now, we've been working on, on like um, low income programs locally at LTD, um, free passes for students, um, maybe not necessarily totally free fares, but free to a lot of users. Um, and maybe that's somewhere in the optimal, but I think that we'll have much better um, frameworks to make those decisions as we continue to refine our model. Thank you. Jeremy, do you have anything to add on this? No, I do not. So Scott, things I, coming in, in the chat. Yeah, I think uh, May, I'd love sorry to put you on the spot, but you mentioned overlooking information, the data we already have, such as household surveys. Uh, do you have any examples in mind that you'd be interested in speaking to? Any, any yes. thoughts? Yeah, I would like to actually, uh, when I was at uh, North Carolina Triangle model team, I had um, analyzed a lot of the data uh, for uh, several things. For, for instance, when we're talking about <clears throat> aging society so we could identify the different travel behaviors of the elderly by age group and also make assumption using census uh, prediction of a percentage of elderly and then we can make from demand side so we would know what might happen um, if everything else stays the same, and if every age group's travel behavior stays the same, what will be the magnitude of the travel in mm -hmm. all different ways we model or use? And also mm -hmm. um, from the autonomous vehicle, while we're waiting for the, the biggest uncertainty on the supply side, the technologies, the, the, uh, the legal issues, uh, um, Etc. At least we could make assumptions to say, okay, at least we will say for a certain um, amount of population, 
uh, who would we adapt the uh, autonomous vehicle? What would happen to the travel patterns in our region? And also for the employment, the commuter uh, trips, earlier before the pandemic, so we were talking about what would happen to us, all of us, especially our modelers, our work will be replaced by the automation a lot in the future. So I was thinking, because when we developed the land use model, what I did is we designed, we, we combined the land use model, land use, the parcel level data, with our household survey and with the employment data. So we have the development, uh, a relationship. Uh, what type of uh, land would have certain type of uh, industry jobs and uh, residents, etc. Then we could see, okay, which industry sectors will be mostly affected by the automation, et cetera, in the future to what degree, we, we don't know. Uh, to all of us, it's a big uncertainty, but we, make, we can make assumptions based on what articles say, uh, what the literature review says, what the data already find, and we can make certain mm -hmm. more reasonable assumptions to do certain things. So there are a lot of data uh, is there. We just, uh, we are so used to, um, for a lot of, uh, um, especially for this household survey, everywhere spent tremendous amounts of money to um, conduct this household survey. But a lot of them MPOs, maybe there's no resources to do anything. We end up with, oh, what do we got from this million dollar survey? We got trip plans, I got a percent of the mode share, and we got the trip generation rate period, boom, done. But there's mm -hmm. so much stuff that we can use from pedestrians, trip planning, everything. Um, equity issues uh, and I'm on the, um, I'm, I'm helping the Duke University's uh, research team. They're doing uh, teenagers is to encourage teenagers to do, um, to engage mm -hmm. into more physical activities. Then we have, have to right. identify why they are not, if they're already living in the community where the transits are service to them, and why they are not aware of the information, they're afraid of how to use it, and mm -hmm. how we can engage community. There are tons of things we can do. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Alex has his hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks, Scott. They need a frantic hand wave because uh, that was so good. I, I just wanted to I wanted to jump on that because that I think that ties into something that that dawned on me as we were doing the system dynamics work. Um, you know, all those examples that were just shared are you know I think you know uh, uh, helped to, to speak to how many insights modelers do have and and what you can pull from the data you do have. And I I think you know I I don't think I can do a better job than Marty already said it. So I'm going to probably fail here, but um, you know, with system dynamics, you know, one of the opportunities that has is clear to me is that it system the system dynamics modeling approach provides this nice formal process and space. You know, I think Marty was using the word space to have these conversations, and it, this might not be the experience from everyone, but for me, my what I've seen is that modelers know a bunch of things about all the years of work they've done modeling and the data they've had. Um, ex exposure to and the relationships they've seen, but unless they get asked the direct question, they almost never share it. And so it, these these venues, this formal venue of having planners and modelers and decision makers and different groups come together up front is this, you know, amazing space where everyone can start speaking the same language and they can see it, you know, on the, the, the causal loop diagram and they could say, oh, you know, I've seen, you know, I, I know people react to price or, you know, I know, I know this, they can start putting their relationships that they have seen and they know to be true. And there can be disagreements clearly and there can be different mental models. And, but so everything that was just said was, was great and perfect. And I, what I would just add is that the system dynamics piece adds this nice formal uh, 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 process up front to kind of think through and expose these and allow everyone to gain that knowledge and basically ask the modelers for it, so. Okay, thank you. Right, that was, that was something that came up with both 
Oregon and Boston, if I'm remembering correctly, which is that, um, you know, not everybody speaks modeling and not everybody speaks planning, but these models make it easier for us all to speak the same language and for us all to um, more quickly target links we think aren't quite representing reality. So there's this thing about how there's reality. We can't know reality, but you, what you think in your head is a mental model of reality. And then what you build into a system dynamics model is a model of your mental model. Um, so if you want to mesh your mental model with someone else's mental model, short of sort of like the brainwave transplant, which we can't do, a system dynamics model, particularly at the causal loop stage, which is not necessarily quantitative, but very easy to follow. We have found in working with both groups that are talking today that it has been a very effective way to get people to say, mm, isn't quite what I was thinking, or mm, yeah, there's a bit more there in a way that I think would have been harder without having that, even as kind of a visual. Any other sort of last thoughts from any panelists? I guess one thing I'll say is, I, you know, especially as you're talking about that, Hannah, I think I, I think there's a lot of potential here to, to use this as a public engagement tool. I mean, we haven't done it, but, but one of the questions is, you know, it, took, it takes some time to assemble one of these. I mean, we met, you know, weekly um, and worked on this. And for public engagement, like, do you, do you come out with a constructed model and say, okay, do folks agree with this? Or do you walk them through the creation of it in a way that they're sort of getting to something that matches what you already have? Or, and then ask them sort of what, what they, you know, where that see where they they actually create connections that are different from what already exists. So I think there's a rich vein of you know exploration there in terms of how we um, how we actually co-create these types of mental models, you know, or the the representations of them in a way that's both um, expedient because we people don't have a lot, you know like months to like spend with us, you know, the public doesn't have months to spend with us to work on, on this sort of thing. Um, but also open enough that we can find out where the participants actually see the world and see the relationships differently than we do as modelers, because that is where we are gonna learn something. And that's the point of public engagement, not just to sort of help people understand the way we think about the world and help them understand our models better, but actually see hear from them the way they envision the world and, and learn from that, what is it that we're missing in all the behavioral and choice aspects of, of our own simulations. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Tim. That seemed like a great note to leave it on. Elizabeth, shall I pass it over to you to close us out? Sure, there's not much to add. I just wanna thank all of the presenters and organizers um, of of this wonderful learning session. It's a great follow on to see um, all the great discussions and interaction we had in that original system dynamic session sort of play out and how it actually helps these, these uh, institutions and organizations uh, in the real world. So that was really exciting to see and learn about. So I really appreciate it. Um, I thank you for adding the link. I just wanna encourage everybody to please um, fill out this really brief survey. Uh, it should take just a couple of seconds. And um, obviously these, these sessions are supported through membership dollars and funds. And so encourage everybody to become a Zephyr member. Um, and then also feel free to sort of visit our webpage and look at our upcoming events uh, or volunteer yourself to help organize a learning session like this or contribute to any of the ones that we've, we've listed on our website. Um, these are you know, we started these during the COVID pandemic. We're still doing it a year later uh, as we welcome back to the, the original team to kick us off here. Um, and uh, it's because we're keeping doing it because people keep coming and people keep seeing value. So I just wanted to, again, thank our presenters again, We've come full circle 2020, 2021.
uh, we'll keep going um, as long as they seem useful. Um, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you. A big thank you to Elizabeth. Yes. Thank you.